Ora, muito bom dia mais uma vez. Bem-vindos à segunda parte da conferência SAPNAL. Para quem só agora se juntou a nós, vale a pena recordar que este ano o evento é dedicado ao tema The Intelligent Enterprise Going From Thinking to Doing. É por isso que estamos aqui. Avançamos agora para ouvir mais um orador que nos vai surpreender a todos pelo seu know-how. Estou em crer que vamos todos ficar muito agradados com a apresentação do Tom. Tom Raftery is a Global Vice President for the multinational, for the multinational SIP, adjunct professor at the Institute International San Telmo in Spain, and a board advisor for a number of startups. Before joining SIP, Tom worked as an independent industry analyst on the Internet of Things, Energy and Clean Tech, and uh, is a futurist for Gerd Leonard's Futures Agency. Tom has a very strong background in technology and social media. He is the co-founder of an Irish software development company and he is the co-founder and director of Hyper Energy Efficient Data Center, the Cork Internet Exchange. He is a futurist and an innovation evangelist. Welcome, Tom, and tell us about the future of digital, what the next 10 years have in store. The stage is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Life is capricious. Life is random. Most days are like every other day. But occasionally, along comes a day that blows you sideways. It's unexpected, tears your world apart. It happens two or three times in a lifetime. And I had one of those days a couple of months ago. These are my two kids, Enrique on the left and Tomas on the right, along with our two idiot dogs. And on the 21st of March this year, my older boy, Tomas, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. It was out of the blue, unexpected. There is no history of diabetes in our family. If you are diabetic, and I've learned a lot about this in the last couple of months, you have these devices. These are the early ones for measuring your blood sugar levels. And the early ones, you used to give 30 microliters of blood and they would take five minutes to give you a result. And my son's one looks like this. On the left there, with the numbers on the screen, is his blood sugar monitor. It requires 0.3 of a microliter of blood. And it takes five seconds to give him a reading. And he has to do this six times a day. And those two insulin pens he injects himself with seven times a day. And as I say, this has been a huge upheaval to our family. But that blood sugar meter has Bluetooth. It's connected. So now we can monitor, and he can monitor, his blood sugar levels. And in the weeks following his diagnosis, his blood sugar levels were way above where they should be, as you can see there. But at the end of April, it looked like this. Because we had access to the data, because he had a digital blood sugar meter, we were able to much, much, much better control his blood sugar levels. And it's not just his blood sugar levels. I went out and bought a connected weighing scales because he was underweight. And you can see, in the two months since, he's put on four kilos. And he's going to be transitioned onto this device. This is called a flash meter. You put these patches, the two white patches there, you put one of those onto your arm. It lasts for 14 days. And then the meter, you just scan it over your arm, and it gives real-time blood sugar uh, readings all day long for 14 days, and after 14 days, you take it off and replace it with a new one. 
and we're hoping in time he'll be put onto an insulin pump as well. Now, why am I talking about that? At an event where we're talking about the intelligent enterprise? Well, this is the intelligent enterprise of our family, our family enterprise. And we're using digital technologies to become intelligent and to manage this event that has happened and to manage his life. It's a very personal example to me, but it shows how you can take data from devices and use them to improve your life, your child's life, your business, your organization, the planet. I'll be looking at kind of a 10-year horizon moving forward, though, similar to what Martin did earlier. And what is 10 years? What does it look like? It's very hard to see the kind of changes that will happen in 10 years. This was the cover of the Forbes magazine 10 years ago, where they asked, could anyone catch Nokia, the cell phone king? That's the kind of change you see in 10 years, because along came Steve Jobs and launched the iPhone. And now, who's heard of Nokia? What are they doing these days? Well, actually, that connected wing skills, that's a Nokia wing skill, so they are still around. But this first iPhone came with 11 applications pre-installed. No app store, so you couldn't put any more apps onto it. And it had one rearward-facing camera, so you couldn't do the old selfie thing. There was no WhatsApp. There was no Instagram. There was no iPad. No Apple TV. Facebook had only just launched to the world. They had been going for a couple of years before that private. So this, this was the world of 10 years ago. Today, it's possible with your iPhone to monitor the health, for example, of women who are pregnant, of kids who have diabetes, of all kinds of things. If I had been here 10 years ago and told you you would be able to use your phone to monitor the health of women who are pregnant, you would have said, Tom, you're on crack. How would that ever work? And yet that's where we are today. Similarly, the data from smartphones can be used to predict the onset of diabetes. So the first thing I did when my kid was diagnosed with diabetes is I went out and I bought him an Apple Watch, which I would never have considered doing for a 15-year-old before. But now I'm capturing all his data, and I'll have a history of all his data. And as more apps come on the scene, I'll have that archive of data to delve into. If we look at some industries and how they're being impacted by digitization, we look at manufacturing first, I'll go through a few of them. We're seeing the shift to things like product as a service, mass customization and lot sizes of one, as Martin talked about earlier, and 3D printing, again, Martin referred to that. With the mass customization, one of our customers, Harley Davidson, Harley Davidson sells individuality. So if you go to the Harley Davidson website, you can choose any of the frames, and there's a long list of them on this page. And they have, because they've digitized their manufacturing, they've reduced the time of manufacture from 21 days to six hours. And now, if you order a bike from them, because it only takes six hours to manufacture, you get an invite to come to the factory where they're building your bike and you're introduced to the block of metal, it's going to become your bike. And you're able to follow it through the line as it's gradually built. And at the end of the six hours, you're handed your keys, and you're able to drive that bike off the lot. And that's a kind of customer experience that is only possible with digitized manufacturing, because they are able to make individual lot sizes of one instead of lot sizes of 10 or 20,000. This is possible. And that kind of customer experience is undeniable. And the, the idea of 3D printing, more and more organizations are getting into 3D printing. Um, I talked to Alan Amling, who's VP for Corporate Strategy of, uh, for UPS last year, and I asked him, why are UPS getting into 3D printing? It's not a, an obvious use case, but it turns out, and I wasn't aware of this, it turns out that UPS have a business where they hold stock of critical parts for their customers in warehouses all over the world. And these critical parts are parts that need to be delivered to site really rapidly, within a few short hours, if a component in an MRI machine breaks down or similar. 
And they said, we don't want to be holding that. He said, we have 1.8 trillion US dollars of our customers' components in our warehouses all over North America alone. So he said, we want to digitize that. So they're now going through a process of certification with their customers, where they walk their customers through the 3D printing process and they show them the, the 3D printed equivalent. And when the customer signs off that they're happy that the 3D printed equivalent is as good or better than the original, then it's digitized and it's in a digital warehouse. So they're shrinking their warehouses. And I said, look, why are you doing this? I mean, and he said, if we didn't do it, someone else would have done it and taken the business away from us. And then there's the shift to product as a service. And we have our customer Kaiser uh, compressors who manufacture compressors, for example. And now they're, they have a separate business model of not selling the compressor itself to the customers, but actually selling the air that the, uh, that the compressor compresses. So these compressors, they compress large amounts of air. Now Kaiser is able to give these big expensive compressors to their customers and charge them for the use, charge them per cubic meter of air compressed. This is a new type of business model. It's starting out, we're seeing more and more organizations moving to it. Uh, not just Kaiser, obviously. Rolls-Royce are doing it with their engines on planes. Philips are doing it in, in, in uh, lighting. The city of Los Angeles doesn't own any street lights. Philips owns them. Philips owns all the street lights in Los Angeles, and they charge the city of Los Angeles per lumen produced by the lights. And in this kind of scenario, the manufacturer, Philips or Kaiser or Rolls-Royce or whoever, they want these devices up and running 99.99999% of the time because any downtime is lost revenue. And the city wants the street lights working all the time. The factory wants their air compressors working all the time. So there's a beautiful alignment of wants and needs. And it, because these are connected devices, if they go offline, the manufacturer knows straight away, sends someone to site, fixed straight away, because it needs to be online all the time. And in a world where we're moving to product as a service, traditional companies who've had a competitive advantage because they've been in asset-heavy industries, are now starting to see competition coming up from places where there wouldn't have been competition before because startup costs, capital costs, are falling. If you no longer have to buy the asset, the, op the OPEX cost goes away, it's now a, a usage cost, or sorry, the CAPEX cost goes away, it's now an OPEX cost. And that allows new disruptors to come in. So looking at that, the energy industry, we're seeing all kinds of disruption happening there. There's three major disruptions happening there. There's the move to connected energy, there's the rise of renewables, and there's the move to storage as a new technology. This is a chart of the cost of solar power over the last 40 years, and it's following what's called the Swanson effect. The Swanson effect says that for every doubling of installed capacity, the price drops 20%. And of course, that creates this beautiful virtuous circle, because as the price falls, it becomes more affordable, more people buy it, more is installed, price drops, etc., etc. And it didn't stop here in 2013 because it kept going. And this is the price from 2013 out to 2017. And you can see the price, and these are international auctions unsubsidized. The, the price in uh, the auctions in 2013 was just over 8 cent per kilowatt hour. By 2017, it had dropped to under 2 cent per kilowatt hour. So from 8 down to 2 in those four years, five years. And to put it in context, I was talking to some executives from DIWA. DIWA are the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, and they told me that they generate 95% of their power by burning gas. And that costs them nine cent per kilowatt hour. So nine cent per kilowatt hour in Dubai burning gas, two cent or under two cent in Saudi, Chile, and Mexico for solar. So solar is becoming massively, massively, massively more attractive. And that's why you see things like this. There was more solar rolled out in 2017 than there was all the fossil fuels combined. 98 gigawatts of solar generation was rolled out globally last year. Over 50 gigawatts of that was rolled out in China. And they rolled out another 10 gigawatts 
in the first quarter of this year. Now, when you consider that a gigawatt is roughly the output of a nuclear power plant, they brought roughly 10 nuclear power plants online the start of this year and over 50 last year in solar alone, because they're also doing massive amounts of wind. California has just passed a law saying all new homes have to have photovoltaic panels on them. And then you see things like this. Tesla have announced their solar roof. This is, this is what it looks like. It looks like regular tiles. But these tiles are solar tiles. And Elon Musk said at their launch that they will cost the same as a slate roof of the same size. So this California announcement was a nice one for them. It's going to do their business no harm whatsoever. And it's not just solar. Wind as well. This is a chart. The blue bars are the cost of wind. And the orange line is the amount of wind deployed globally. And it's not just that the price of solar is coming down. It's also that the wind, or sorry, wind coming down, the, the wind turbines themselves are getting better. They're getting bigger, they're generating more power. The latest GE wind turbines generate 12 megawatts, which is enormous, both in terms of size and the amount of energy they create. But also, their capacity factor is increasing. The capacity factor of a wind turbine is the amount of time it is generating power. So the GE ones I referred to have a capacity factor of 63%, and this wind farm here, it's an offshore wind farm, has a 65% capacity factor. And again, to put that in context, according to the EIA, coal and gas have capacity factors of 54 and 56% respectively. So now wind is turning out to be better at generating and cheaper than coal and gas. It generates for more time. So we're entering a whole new era. And of course, we're here in Portugal. And here in Portugal, renewables are not big news. Portugal, for the first time in March of this year, generated 103% of its demand from renewables alone. So more than the, than the country required. I mentioned storage. This is the price of lithium-ion batteries from 2010 to 2017. It fell 80% in that time. And it hasn't stopped there. It keeps falling. Which means batteries are now becoming more affordable. And it's not just that they're becoming more affordable, they're also not failing. This is a chart of the battery capacity of batteries in Tesla Model S's and Model X's over kilometers driven. So by 250,000 kilometers driven, they were still at 91% capacity. How many of your cars have driven 250,000 kilometers? Would you still say they're at 91% of what they were when they were bought? And batteries are getting better in other ways as well. These are kind of weekly headlines that pop up. This is a nano, um, nanotechnology company that have gone into an agreement with BMW. They have a new technology around anodes where they can get 15% more charge in the batteries. They reckon by 2023 that'll be up to 40% and that's when BMW, BMW will be using their batteries in their cars. And because of advances like this, the batteries are becoming cheaper, they're lasting longer, they're becoming more energy dense, their charge times are falling. The global market for batteries is set to grow 30 times Sorry, double six times between now and 2030. You can see we are today here, 2018. That's the market, global market for batteries out to 2030. If you have money to invest, <laughs> batteries might be something to think about. And then you see things like this. Uh, this is a stock photo, so don't, don't mind the solar panels. The, this is the, Tesla are rolling out their solar roofs, so ones that look like the previous picture, along with their batteries. They have this battery called a Tesla Powerwall battery. And they're putting them on 50,000 homes in South Australia. So the houses will have generation plus storage. And they're connecting these 50,000 homes to the grid with a single interface. So now this is a virtual power plant. It's like cloud computing for energy. It's a virtual power plant capable of generating 600 megawatts of power, which is the same as a coal power plant. 
but it's all from solar roofs with batteries. It's a whole new world. And I had predicted for a long time that Tesla would do this, that they would start creating virtual power plants, but I got it wrong. I said they would do it with their cars first, but obviously the cars are not stationary, so it's not as easy. But they have a, they have a stated aim of hitting 500,000 cars a year starting this year. They're not gonna make that. They're not gonna make that because they're having production issues with their new Model 3. But if they hit 250,000 cars this year, or next year, and the cars have an average battery size of 80 kilowatts, 250,000 by 80 kilowatts is 20 gigawatt hours of storage. That's 20 nuclear power plants worth of storage. Distributed. Always on, always connected. Tesla are the disruptor in the energy industry. If you ever thought Tesla was a car company, they're not. Tesla are an energy company. And the utilities are going to start having issues because generation costs are coming down. So they may have to move to something like an all-you-can-eat model, the kind of thing that you get with your broadband. You pay 50 euros a month and you get as much energy as you can consume, and then you pay extra for services on top. What kind of services would they be? There's lots you could think of. This is my dad. You're meeting a lot of my family today. I took this picture at his 80th birthday. He lives in Ireland. My mother died in 2007. My sister lives in Dallas, Texas. And I live in the south of Spain. Would I pay his energy company 10, or 15 euros a month to get a notification if his lights didn't go off at 11 o'clock at night? Or they didn't come on at 8 o'clock in the morning? Absolutely, in a heartbeat. And yet, I haven't come across any energy company who's giving services like that. There's all kinds of other services, smart home management you can think of as well. You know, so there's, there's lots of things energy companies can be doing. If you have a second home and the lights go on there when you're not there, you know, managing the temperature of your, your, your water heater, if it's an electric water heater, or your fridge, air conditioning, all these kind of things are services that utility companies can and should and will start to offer to make up for the fact that the cost of generation are falling and the amount of electricity people are demanding is falling as devices get more efficient and as people roll out solar, solar roofs. Consequently, the utility companies are loving the fact that electric vehicles are coming. Because in North America alone, if we move all cars to electric, that's an increase of 774 terawatts of demand. Globally, it's an increase of 300x on the amount of energy currently required. So, brings me nicely into transportation. There are several things happening in transportation. We've got the move to predictive maintenance, and our customer Continental is rolling out predictive maintenance on vehicles using our platform. They have use our SAP Connected Fleet platform to give predictive maintenance to service centers, so it's a B2B to C play. So the idea is that as you're driving, if something is about to fail, it will notify your service center. Your service center will know this particular car belonging to this particular customer is going to fail with 80% probability with this component in the next two weeks. So they can order in the part ahead of time. It completely changes the experience of a car breakdown. Because instead of you just drifting off to the side of the road or a warning light coming on, having to go in for a diagnosis, it's all pre-done. So the first time failure rate or the first time fix rate is up to 99% and the turnaround time for the repair is brought way, 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 way down. But more than that, we've got a huge shift in transportation in the move to electrification. And this has been given a big boost by China. China is the world's largest automobile market by a long shot. And they passed a law which said, if you're a manufacturer of cars and you want to sell cars in China, then by 2019, 
10% of your fleet needs to be new energy vehicles. And by 2020, it has to be 12%. And so on up, by 2025, 20% of your sales in China have to be electric vehicles. And because all the manufacturers want access to the Chinese market, they all came out with big announcements about all the electric vehicles that they're going to start producing. It has shifted the world completely. Even Porsche. Porsche have said that by 2030, all of their cars, all of their cars will be electric. This is the new Mercedes EQC. It's coming out next year. It's expected to have a range of 500 kilometers on the battery. And this is the Tesla Roadster coming out in 2020. It's expected to have a range of 1,000 kilometers. How many of you have a car that can go 1,000 kilometers on a full tank? When you have electric vehicles going 1,000 kilometers on a full charge, suddenly it's the fossil fuel cars that start to have range anxiety. Not only that, this is the list of the top 10 repairs to vehicles in 2015. Not one of these faults can occur in an electric vehicle. Electric vehicles have about 20 moving parts in their drivetrain. Internal combustion engine vehicles have over 2,000. So because there's far more parts, there's far more parts to fail. And it's not just cars. Harley-Davidson have announced they're producing an electric motorbike next year. Buses. China is the world leader in elect fully electric buses. They were, uh, they were disappointed that they only sold 89,000 last year because they'd sold over 100,000 the year before. Trucks are going fully electric. This is the Tesla Semi. Uh, this is the Volvo electric truck. This is the DAF electric truck. This is the Peterbilt. Well, this is the announcement that Peterbilt are going to produce an electric truck. So all the big truck manufacturers are moving to electric. And this is important because if you look at the amount of fuel consumed by these trucks, buses, refuse trucks, etc., the trucks and the transit buses consume most fuel, and they consume a lot of it in cities. So the pollution, the particulates that come out, the noise, all of that will go away. It's not just trucks. Planes are starting to go electric as well. This is an announcement from Airbus and Rolls-Royce that they're getting together with Siemens, and they're going to develop initially a hybrid plane, but we all know that hybrids are eventually going to go fully electric. And this is an announcement from EasyJet that they're working with Wright Electric to produce a fully electric short haul plane capable of flying two hours and delivering um, 180 passengers. And they expect to have that in the air by 2026. Shipping is going electric as well. These are ferries in the, scan in the Nordics. And you can see they have reduced emissions by 95% and costs by 80%. And consequently, they got 53 additional orders. And Rolls-Royce have seen this, so they've set up their ship intelligence arm. And their ship intelligence arm is looking into creating droid ships, so completely autonomous ships that are fully electric. And speaking of autonomous, cars are going autonomous as well. That's the next wave. California is now allowing the manufacturers to test their autonomous vehicles with no driver in the cars. So there are now cars driving around California by themselves with no one in them. GM have seen this, and GM are bringing out a fleet of autonomous taxis next year using what they call their Maven platform. And for GM, this is hugely important because it's a game changer. I talked about product as a service earlier with Philips Lighting, etc. GM see this as transportation as a service. They will no longer be selling cars, they will be selling miles traveled with these taxis. Today, GM makes $30,000 on every car it sells, on after sales. Not on initial sales profit, but on after sales. 
And that's going away because cars are becoming electric so they won't fail as often. And fewer people are going to buy them because they'll be autonomous. So they'll make far, far less. So instead of selling the car, they're now going to set up their own fleet of GM-owned taxis and they'll compete with Uber and they'll compete with Lyft under the Maven brand. It's transportation as a service. And it's not just them. Google are getting into this with their Waymo, uh, their Waymo self-driving service, and they're launching that this year. They're not waiting until GM does it next year. They're doing it this year. And we know that autonomous vehicles are safer. The data from, uh, there was a crash of a Tesla car in Florida in 2016. The NHTSA took all the data from all the miles traveled by every Tesla vehicle since Tesla started selling them, analyzed it, and they saw that Tesla cars in autonomous mode crash 40% less than Tesla cars being driven uh, manu manually. So autonomous cars crash 40% less. And the insurance companies have seen this. And so now Direct Line in the UK, which is the largest insurer in the UK, offers a discount for people with autopilot in their car. And they started at 5%, but that's going to increase. And soon it'll be, oh, you want to drive the car yourself? Oh, well, that's this whole other policy over here. You know, so that's... There's this, I, I use a, a, a website called CB Insights, and they've got some great material there. But they talk in this about 24 industries that are impacted by the move to autonomous vehicles, and there's a number of them. Uh, there are a lot of obvious ones, like the parking industry, for example, or you know, the driving schools, or people who make road signs, or traffic lights, or things like that. So there's a huge amount of, who's going to be the first uh, car company that does a deal with Netflix? I mean, that's, that's an obvious one, because when you're sitting on a plane, what do you do? You look at the movie or you get out your laptop. It'll be the same in cars. Then we've got the move to drones carrying people, which is the next big step. And Uber have their arm called Uber Air, and they're now testing their flying taxis. And they're also talking to NASA. And they're co-developing with NASA the standards that these drones will use to talk to each other for collision avoidance, but also to talk to air traffic control. So these will be open standards shared amongst everybody to have collision avoidance amongst these drones in the air, and again, traffic control to avoid planes. And it's not just them. This is Hang, a Chinese company who are developing drones, and this is Lilium, a German company who are doing it, and this is Boeing who are doing it, and Airbus. This is Airbus's urban air mobility arm, and they're not just developing the Vahana, this is their Vahana craft, which they, they did the first uh, tests of this year in January. But this is a, a, a partnership they have with Audi, where they develop the drone part, and the drone part docks with the Audi, and is capable of lifting the Audi, so you drive to a drone port, and you get lifted to wherever and dropped somewhere else. And if you think that's freaky, SpaceX are saying we'll be traveling in rockets. They have their big, their BFR rocket platform that they're going to do. They're going to put spaceports in all the big cities. And for the price of a transatlantic flight, they will transport you from, for instance, London to Shanghai in 30 minutes or less. Who wants to travel in a rocket? I know I do. That's going to be awesome. Healthcare. Healthcare has been massively shifted as well by the, the, the move to data-based healthcare. The likes of, um, I talked about my, my son's diabetes and his glucose meter. But this is my sister. Again, you're meeting a lot of my family today. The one who lives in Texas. She was told she had high blood pressure last year. So she got a connected cuff to measure her blood pressure. It turns out she had low, low blood pressure, 108 over 75. So they told her she had what's called white coat syndrome. I'd never heard of it. You can Google it, it's a thing. White coat syndrome means that you go into a doctor's office and your blood pressure goes up. And it's totally understandable. You go to the doctor's office, you're already feeling unwell, you're in a waiting room with five or six other people who are coughing and spluttering, uh, you're waiting 15 or 20 minutes to see the doctor, you go in to see the doctor, you're thinking about your next meeting on the other side of the city or you have to pick up your kids or meet your boss or a customer or whatever. No wonder your blood pressure is elevated and your pulse is up. And then the doctor takes that data 
and it's supposed to make a diagnosis on it. It's completely out of context. It's a snapshot out of context. Whereas we're moving to a world of connected people. You know, you have your smartwatches or your Fit bands or whatever, and they can transmit your health data, and they will, to a private health cloud. And that private health cloud, when it notices some of your vitals going out of tolerance, will send an alert to your trusted healthcare provider who will bring you in for routine maintenance. It's going to be predictive maintenance for people. And the insurance companies are looking at this and seeing this as a, as a possibility as well. Uh, this is a, an insurance company called Discovery in South Africa. And they are giving Apple Watches to their customers and setting goals for them. You have to do this many steps this week, this many steps next week. And for people who sign up to this uh, program, it's called Vitality, for people who sign up to Vitality, they have the data which says they get sick less often, they, when they are admitted to hospital, their hospital stays are shorter, and their life expectancy is longer. And this is all from connected data. And the, the technology companies have seen this, they're moving into it, Uber are going in there, Lyft are going in there, Amazon are going in there, if I, any of you have been in a business that Amazon has moved into, you know what they do. They steamroll that industry. Apple are moving in there as well, and you, know, you, can, you can understand why, uh, given that they have sensors on a lot of people now in terms of phones and watches. And Google are going in there as well. Now, Martin mentioned 3D printing earlier and 3D printing of human organs. Uh, one I don't want to say downside, but one uh, unintended consequence of the move to um, autonomous vehicles is there will be fewer car crashes, fewer people killed, so fewer organ donors. So we're going to see a massive reduction in the amount of organ donations. And that's why this is important, the move to 3D printed human organs. This is a test of 3D printed ovaries in mice, transplanted into the mice, and the mice gave birth to live young. But in Spain last year, they 3D printed human skin. And if you read this article, scroll down to it, there's an interview, a video interview at the bottom with the lead scientist where he absolutely states this is just the beginning. Our ultimate goal is to 3D print hearts, lungs, livers, kidneys, etc. And we will do it using people's own skin cells or stem cells, and that way there'll be no issues around rejection. I'll talk quickly, because I'm running out of time, about some of the technologies that are enabling a lot of this digital transformation. Blockchain, this is an article in the Harvard Business Review by Joy Ito. Uh, he's the head of their media lab in, in MIT, and he says that it's going to do to the financial system what the internet did to media, and we're seeing that already. This is an, a blog post by Christine Lagarde of the IMF, where she talks about how it's fast, it's efficient, and it's inexpensive to use blockchain for money transactions, and consequently, Santander, have rolled out a, a blockchain-powered uh, uh, foreign transactions uh, platform for their customers now. It's live currently in Brazil, Spain, Poland, and the UK, and by summer, they say it'll be live globally, and currently it's a, a one day for the money to transfer. They say by summertime it'll be instant. And Goldman Sachs are talking about launching a new cryptocurrency. MIT are looking at it for qualifications. Microsoft want to use blockchain for digital identity systems. Uh, AWS, or Amazon, are rolling it out on their AWS platform, a one-button uh, push to launch blockchain on your applications, similar to what we have in our uh, blockchain as a service. Uh, they're using it, the World Food Program, are using it in Jordan to uh, give uh, food to refugees, Syrian refugees there. And the, uh, there's a thing called the Energy Web Foundation, which is a conglomerate of energy companies who are seeing what's happening in blockchain and are interested in getting in there because they know it's going to very quickly disrupt their platform and they want to be in at the ground floor setting the standards for blockchain in energy. And then we have artificial intelligence. And this is a chart, this is a, a log chart, if you look at the, 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 the left-hand side there, it's a log chart of petaflops used in artificial intelligence tests since 2013, and it has increased over 300,000 times. The doubling, we talk about Moore's law being a doubling, 
every 18 months. The amount of petaflops used in AI has doubled every three and a half months since 2013, every three and a half months. So it's 300,000 times uh, more compute used in AI now, which is why we're seeing things like this. London hospitals are using it. The headline here is wrong. It says replace, it's augment rather than replace if you actually read through the article. And we see things like this. This, this device is called a spinning jenny. A spinning jenny was the first mechanical loom. It was invented in the UK in the 1750s. And there was huge problems in the UK at the time when this was introduced because people thought it would come and take their jobs. Sound familiar? They broke factories up. It caused huge riots. Lots of people were killed. It was very serious. And what happened? In 1760, the amount of spinners and weavers in the UK was 7,800. By uh, 1796, so 36 years later, it had gone up to 320,000. Why? Because these were more efficient, they could create more yarn of higher quality at a cheaper price so more people could afford yarn. And as more people could afford it, they needed more factories to produce it. So you got economies of scale, more factories coming out, pr producing more cloth. Then you needed to have uh, distribution systems, you needed to have supply chains, you needed to have road, rail, coal mines, etc. And then we had the Industrial Revolution. And Deloitte had this interesting study on labor trends over the last 140 years. And you can see the light blue is manual labor, the dark blue is more caring professions. And then you see things like this. You have a move away from having uh, the muscle jobs, the launderers, the washers, etc., and a move towards more professional services. Not just professional services, but as we have more disposable income, we tend to go to the pub more often, so the amount of bar staff has gone up globally. And it's not just bar staff, it's hairdressers. The amount of hairdressers has gone up as well because we have more, again, more money to spend on things like looking better, going to the gym, etc. And it goes up all except for that kind of dip there in the 1980s, which might account for this. Yeah, that is me, but we'll move on. <laughs> Lastly, I was speaking to uh, Pascal Brosset, who was uh, at the time CTO of Schneider Electric, and this was in 2014 uh, in Boston. September 2014, and he told me that it cost them at the time $2 to put a system on a chip. So, smart and intelligence. And he said, Tom, because it's only costing us $2, why wouldn't we put a system on a chip on everything we manufacture? So that's what they were doing. In 2014, they were putting a system on a chip on everything they manufactured, right down to circuit breakers. So you can imagine today, it's costing far less than $2. So today, everything is going to be connected. And because everything is going to be connected, terms like digital transformation, terms like Internet of Things are going to become redundant. We won't be speaking with them anymore. In the same way, we no longer say, I have an Internet-connected phone. It's the kind of thing we used to say back when we had the Nokia N95. But now every phone is Internet-connected, so it's just a phone. So digital transformation, we won't be talking about it. Internet of Things, we won't be talking about it because everything will be connected. Some last thoughts. We are, by nature, a pessimistic species. We highlight bad news. It's part of our lizard brain from when we were living on the savannah. We had to remember lions. We didn't have to remember cherries or something like that. But actually, if you look at the data, the amount of extreme poverty in the world has gone down. The amount of basic education and literacy have gone up. The child mortality levels have gone down, vaccinations have gone up, and for the most part, democracy has gone up as well, apart from a few notable exceptions recently, but we won't go into that. The world is getting to be a far better place. We've never had it so good. Last thought from Nikola Tesla from 1926. He said, when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole world will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is, all things being part of a real and rhythmic whole. 1926. I call myself a futurist. Obrigado.